So, uh, before we uh, get into any of the actual content, I have a few announcements to make. Number one, I am now shifting all stream times and stuff like that uh, and upload times to 6 p.m. So that's one hour earlier than it is now. Uh, this is going to be my last 7 p.m. stream. Everything else will be at 6 p.m. I feel like this will be better. It will allow me to stream for longer. I will get less tired. I can keep the energy going for longer and I can also get a reasonable amount of sleep. Uh, as well as having, you know, giving the European people more time to, to catch my stuff, basically. Which is very, very, very cool. My name is Ryan. I, uh, I'm Dutch. Uh, I go by Inspector here on the, on the website and on Discord. I myself, I am currently in a study to be a civics teacher. So, which means I mainly do political science, social science, and also a bit of philosophy. I think it's fine to begin with just what social control is because mm -hmm. I think people get freaked out a little bit if they hear the word control. Social control mainly is just the way a society like makes sure that there's not uh, any undesired behavior. Desired behavior is encouraged and undesired behavior is discouraged. We you know we have laws that prevent people from walking free when they murder someone and social control actually has quite a broad range. It can be very, very libertarian, but it can also be like full on government control, uh, like we see with facial recognitions nowadays. With social control, we have to first begin with the whole idea of deviancy, uh, people who steal something, you know, they try to satisfy a certain financial goal that they otherwise can do through legal means. Sometimes a little deviancy doesn't really harm people, but sometimes it can inflict immense harm on like the people that do it themselves or their environment. So how are we going to discourage people from doing that? There are essentially like two types of social control when we're talking about who does it. Are we going to do it with the government or are we going to do it with society itself, with citizens? Um, so there are two types of social control that we've discussed so far, formal and uh, informal and informal is you know otherwise also called a socialization in which you sort of um, want your population to internalize certain beliefs that you know create like personal barriers towards doing certain activities rather than having another party uh, restrict your access your ability to do those such as a government for example while formal social control is when a government, a separate party, puts strong barriers and legal obstacles uh, between, you know, you and your ability to do something. The kinds of social control we have, we actually go like from very, very much relying on liberty of people, you know, their autonomy, to like full on uh, government control. And the more libertarian uh, side of this argument, we would say that they would probably prefer nudges. Nudges are like just small... Uh, pushes to encourage uh, desired behavior. So, for example, we want to print less um, pieces of paper. So we make printers uh, have a standard double page copy, you know, that they are not able to have one page copies, but automatically go to two pages. Mm -hmm. And a nudge doesn't require a state doctrine. But we have the other side of the medal, and which is paternalism. And paternalism is actually quite complex paternalism if i would broadly define it is a form of infringement on the personal freedom and autonomy of a person with a, a yeah, beneficent or protective intent we do that with people who you know have for example uh, serial killers we lock them up because we see that they have uh, inflicted harm upon other people they might inflict uh, harm on other people so for like the good of the society we lock them away yeah, when we have to look at paternalism, um, we would look more to Dworkin. It's uh, Gerald Dworkin, and he actually said there are three conditions. It needs to limit a subject's freedom. It needs to be performed without the subject's cons uh, consent, and it needs to be performed with a beneficial intent. So, for example, let's say that um, somebody in society agrees that um, let's say murder is bad, okay? Um, mm -hmm. And both the government and the private citizen agrees to this. And they say that they think it's a good idea uh, that the government makes murder illegal. Technically, that infringes on their right to murder people, um, but it's like a consensual limitation on their own freedoms. Is that considered paternalism or is that not considered paternalism? Uh, it would not be considered paternalism because, yeah, there is a, a different type of this. It is called uh, constructionalism, a form of paternalism, but with consent. 
Then I have one more yeah. question as well. Okay, I, I can put this in an example. That's way easier, actually. So I am fine with the government putting restrictions on people's ability to drive through the use of driver's licenses and traffic laws. Um, now, technically, that could be considered an infring infringement on freedom, but I would actually consider that an increase in my freedom. It increases my freedom to just walk around kind of wherever I want without having the fear of, you know, a six-year-old driver driving up on the pavement and crushing my body into the nearest building. I feel like that's a, you know, that, that, that increases my freedom to walk around freely in society while it technically also limits freedom. This could be paternalism, but if like the majority of the people consent to it, it would fall on the contractualism where paternalism actually says, well, we're going to limit your freedom because it harms you or yourself, but we know you don't like it, but for like society's sake, we're going to do it. And contractualism actually says, we're fine with limiting our freedom. You know, we're fine with driver's license. It's actually a reasonable argument for it. It's justified on the basis that we all would agree to the inf uh, interference. Except for the uh, Libertarian Party. They don't, uh, they don't believe driver's licenses. Yeah, they, 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 they don't like any infringement. There was this, there's this wonderful video here. Gary Johnson at the Libertarian debate. Um, he got booed for supporting driver's licenses. It's a pretty funny video. Should someone have to have a government issued license to drive a car hell no what's next requiring a license to make toast in your own damn toaster the license to drive you know i'd like to see some competency exhibited by people before they drive uh libertarians <laughs> <laughs> they're truly uh, uh yeah free thinkers if you put it that way yeah we have like a lot of types of paternalism um it is, I think it's like 12 or something. So for example, there's hard and soft paternalism, where a hard paternalism actually permits uh, restrictions of liberty to prevent undesired behavior, yeah. even when a person in question is fully cognizant of his actions and their consequences. So that would say like someone wants uh, to commit suicide, they know it, they want it, they don't want to live anymore. Hard paternalism says, step in and prevent it where soft paternalism actually says um, we're primarily concerned with the autonomy of the person. So justifying the restriction of liberty only to make sure whether the person in question was indeed choosing to harm or endanger himself. I think euthanasia is really a good example on this. So that's hard and soft paternalism, mainly questioning like, is the person himself fully cognizant of their choice? Mm -hmm. Do you think you could provide an example of, uh, of soft paternalism as well? So for hard one, we have committing suicide, for example, if that were to be illegal. Uh, for soft paternalism, uh, what could be an example of that? If someone uh, kills another human being and in court, we actually hear, you know, it wasn't their own choice. When you want to kill someone and they, catch you actually in the act they would say is this you or are you um, pressured i'm really curious if this is your choice if somebody else is pressuring you or maybe you have um, a certain mental illness that pushes you to make this choice i guess uh, maybe an example of this as well it could be um age of consent laws right yeah i i would actually like say that everything that has to do with age of consent mm -hmm. has it's co has come from soft paternalism. Mm -hmm. Like we don't know if these people are actually capable of making these hard choices. You know, it requires a lot of uh, uh, factors to actually uh, establish that. So therefore we limit like the age that they can, for example, vote, drive, uh, drink alcohol. Um, so I, th I think all those things are soft paternalism uh, examples. Then we have broad and narrow paternalism. With narrow paternalism, um, it's mainly about the state. So state coercion. Someone who is interested in narrow paternalism would say, all right, like what does the state do in this? But they are not necessarily like interested in what companies or individuals or societies do. Whereas a broad paternalist would probably look at all aspects that put limits on something. So it could be the state as well, but also uh, an institution. So, for example, private hospitals or like uh, your family even. Then we go to weak versus strong paternalism. Weak paternalism says um, it's legitimate to use coercive means to achieve a person's desired consequence. So like the requiring seatbelts, um, an assumption that people desire life and health and yep. therefore should be forced to take measures to protect themselves. Strong paternalism would say you would prevent a person from achieving a desired consequence uh, on the grounds that he may be confused or mistaken about his ends, but not if he understands his choice. Like we have now with the mask debate, mm -hmm. like uh, people who believe in QAnon 
uh, they think that's not a good idea of uh, wearing masks. We would say as a society or a state, they have some irrational uh, thinking going on. Yep. We are going to make it mandatory. Mm -hmm. So that would be a strong paternalism where weak paternalism would say, um, we hope you actually value your life and your health. Put on a mask, please. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, yeah, that's uh, the whole idea. Right, then we go to pure and impure paternalism. Pure is to restrict the actions of people who may be harmed by their own behavior. Suicide would be um, a good example of this. Whereas impure uh, paternalism would actually look, for example, at third parties being protected from the actions of the agents. Like what are the social consequences for people when a loved one of them uh, commits suicide? We have one last one, which is moral and welfare paternalism, where moral paternalism says the restriction we are doing is because we intend, uh, we have good intent for the person. We would restrict someone's ability to, for example, buy a bottle of alcohol because he's an alcoholist and because we in have good intent. You know, we want them to be uh, kicked off of alcohol, for example, because it's from a moral standpoint. Well, welfare paternalism is more or less designed to promote like the general welfare. We would restrict people's ability to buy alcohol if they like drink a lot of alcohol, <clears throat> because it would reduce uh, hospital costs. You know, we, it would reduce uh, healthcare costs in general. Uh, in those kind of things. If you hear it like this, uh, how paternalism works, and maybe even contractualism, what would you prefer as a utilitarian to maybe combat hate speech? Um. Yeah, so, so I, I probably again this is uh, I I haven't had time to to sit down and think about it really hard since then. But right now, I am probably leaning towards some um, very you know closely examined and constitutionally enshrined restrictions on uh, on the most sort of like base forms of hate speech, which is speech targeting minority groups that does not contribute any value to any discourse. And this is basically, you know, used to dissuade, um, you know, uh, people that are bigots from engaging or sorry, from uh, from restricting other people's other minorities ability uh, to speak freely because they feel like they might be in danger if they choose to do so. So that's sort of where I'm, where I'm leaning towards right now. I think that that will bring about the, the better good for everyone in society and for the uh, for the public discourse discourse. I think. Um... The whole idea of hate speech probably really fits in the moral paternalism because we want to maybe have laws, you know, by the state to improve a person's um, moral character. We have talked about the slippery slope, I think, last time. Yep. Um, and the slippery slope was mainly because, like, all right, we can make laws to, like, maybe prohibit certain kinds of inciting hatred or violence, but that can be used by an authoritarian to squash down uh, revolutionaries, for example. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, Gerald Dworkin actually, uh, his critics actually say the slippery slope is mainly because we have a difficulty in establishing universally accepted criteria for determining incompetence, thus creating a slippery slope of potential encroachment on personal liberties. But my main issue with like the whole idea of paternalism is uh, the Richard Wolf meme. Socialism yeah. is like when, uh, socialism government is when the government does, does stuff. And stuff. Like, I, I see a lot of leftists being really allergic to say, oh, maybe the government might step in. But just, you know, having the state do it doesn't necessarily make it authoritarian. Yeah. Because what contractionalism says, we have consent, we vote for it, we approve it, and the state has a mandate to do it. And we might review the state if they uh, are going to misabuse it. I can think so, that maybe one of the reasons. Why a lot of people have such an aversion to it, um, like a lot of uh, you know philosophical and economic concepts. I, I I think that a large part may have to do with the um the wording of it. You know, uh, mm -hmm. paternalism uh, as a means by which you know the government can ostracize undesirable activity. You know, like it's <laughs> uh, <laughs> it rings a few bells uh, for a lot of people and uh, it raises a few flags, but. Uh, yeah. That, that's probably part of the reason, but absolutely, there, there, there is some form of... Uh, I, I agree with what you're saying overall. I'm just providing my little um, yeah. analysis there. It's okay if then the state has like a law where they can say, well, it's probably a good idea if people who kill, especially like serial killers, mm -hmm. might be not in society. So are um, you uh, are you discounting the, the will of the uh, large pro-murder bloc uh, when it comes to political <laughs> discourse? I think the main issue that we have to take from this is that um, paternalism, not just contractionalism, are tools. 
like if you're going to combat hate speech, I don't think like mainly every individual level is going to combat hate speech. Of course, you're going to have education because that is going to have a bigger influence. But you know, you, I don't necessarily want every parent to decide if they are going to combat hate speech. Yeah. Because if you're going to live in uh, an area that has like, uh, I think we have, uh, yeah, we have towns here in the Netherlands that have like uh, voted massively on a nationalist party. Um, I don't really trust those people to combat hate speech. Like yeah. they're not going to do it. You know, it's just like a, a little bubble of racism there. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to have to use different tools. Mm-hmm. You're going mm-hmm. to have to use maybe nudges, of course, but you might use paternalism like like that. And you really have to like look at what's going to offer you the best result that we as leftists want. Mm-hmm. Um, but you really have to set aside this aversion for uh using the government at all i understand it if we were like uh if you live in a kingdom and you have like a king or an aristocracy uh, aristocracy and they're going to decide what is undesired behavior but like i presume a lot of people live in a democracy and we can vote for people that promote certain values that we want and through that we could have popular consent exactly Um, and uh, leftists need to realize that um, whether you like it or not, we will need to engage in acts of paternalism if we want to reach the ultimate goal of uh, of force feminizing all men. If you want to promote certain values, you would still have to have a government that is going to write laws, that is going to have certain forms of uh, punishment in, uh, for things that we don't like, or, or maybe going to deal with things that we don't like. So we really need to like move away from this as leftists. And I don't really care if the like right wingers that are going to say, "Oh, you, you see, uh, it's it's indeed the meme is true. Uh, socialism is when the government does stuff." It's like, yeah, yeah. no, we we like uh, we abolished slavery. We we made sure that children didn't need to work anymore in in most of the countries, and that they, they had an education. We are having people that want to have uh, healthcare as a right that are literally running for president. Mm-hmm. So, um, if you want those things, you need to write them in law, like. Do you really trust like individual societies and communities to decide for themselves? Like, hmm, are we going to combat racism? Well, yeah. no, you know, it's like you're not going to maximize anything. People mm. are like presuming, like, oh shit, we're going to f- go full authoritarian on this. Like, mm-hmm. no, like, especially if you like, live in a democracy and uh, if you have like a, a quite a strong uh, judicial branch, yeah, you, you still have. Um, innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, exactly. And this is like runs into one of the core like issues I find with a lot of leftist communities. Yeah, like, like like there's a disconnect right between um, all the values they hold and like the goals they want to reach. Right. So I, I always like saying this because it's honestly like it's such an important thing to keep in mind. We don't want the world to be a better place because we're leftists. We are leftists because we want the world to be a better place. And a lot exactly. of people feel like the end goal is like a society in which there's no government infringement and everything is done, you know, in accordance with texts that were written, you know, ages ago. Um, and that we never, ever compromise on anything in order to reach goals. And that that makes you, you know, like a liberal or whatever. Um, certain types of things, they just, they just block off and they don't even want to consider it, right? Um, so things like, for example, uh, this free speech discussion, you know, I've heard so many, you know, left of people saying, yeah, you know, free speech is a mandatory, da, 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 da. there should be no restrictions on it whatsoever. But a lot of those arguments end up being fallacious. And that's why it was like such a revelation for me on Sunday, right? Because I was like, hold on, I, I actually thought about these arguments for free speech, you know, complete free speech, no restrictions on like, you know, um, speech that incites hatred or violence. I'm like, these arguments are kind of garbage. I'm not going to lie. And it's so frustrating because we understand these as leftists, right? We are completely capable of making these type of arguments, like the slippery slope arguments, when somebody says, for example, having, you know, government enforced worker co-ops will lead to the government, you know, beginning to overreach. And then in 20 years, the government will, you know, be controlling everything about the economy, right? We will say, no, that's a slippery slope fallacy. That's bad. But when it comes to, you know, freedom of speech, a lot of uh, leftists would be like, no, never, we can't even touch that because then we begin, you know, an irreversible process by which we fall into a society in which nobody can ever, you know, engage in any speech that is seen as undesirable by any government. Like, yeah. And then the fact that a lot of people, uh, like we discussed before, right, see 
um, in certain contexts, typically what is right now in the status quo, that any infringement or like anything that the government does to change any laws or whatever is from this point forward an infringement on rights. So like the driver's license example, for example, I love it because I want, you know, I, I feel like or like gun rights as well. You know, I am anti-gun uh, because I believe that I am live a more, you know, free life when I know that I am at my full capacity to feel safe in society without having to carry a tool that has, you know, lethal action and that, you know, risks increases my risk for, uh, you know, committing suicide or, uh, you know, having accidents with it, you know, shooting myself or whatever, uh, or yeah, having to go through all the training and the financial things that go with that. I feel like I'm more free in society because there's less things I need to do just to feel safe. Um, but then a lot of leftists would be like, no, that's the government infringing on your right to carry a firearm. That's bad because it limits freedom when I would, I would, I would say it increases freedom fundamentally. And that's also an yeah. issue I see with the like authoritarian libertarian divide, right? Um, yeah. some measures of government control give more freedom, uh, than others, but yeah. Yeah. No, but it's, it's always like, uh, there's always two sides to the metal. Like if you ban something or if you like free up something. You're always going to infringe on someone's right. If I'm going to ban slavery, I'm going to infringe upon the slaveholders. If I'm going to free up the speech, I'm going to infringe on people that uh, do want legal means to punish people for what they said. Mm -hmm. Like you will always have that, but we have to keep in mind we we are not in here for government for government's sake. Yeah, like exactly. we are not in here for using the government just to be the government as leftists and to have power or something, we're using the government because that is the highest tool we have to ensure people have a decent life. And we can still say uh, the structure is bad, we're going to reform it, we want to uh, have a better government, uh, maybe have different forms, but like we, we should really back off as leftists as just saying like the government is bad, because mm -hmm. I think that's like a bit of an edgy libertarian take on it, like like leave that onto the end caps, please. We can still prefer to have more contractionalism or more be more not just maybe focus more on education. You know, I'm an upcoming teacher myself. I really prefer education in this because I think it's a really good means to uh, to achieve this. But, but it's not enough. Yeah, education will take a long long time before people like have a decent moral. Um, compass in their head you know there are still people of 50 years old that still probably are idiots i would like pose the question like all right you don't trust the government infringing on this do you trust twitter we see what the us does on twitter on youtube lots of big right wingers being banned on the platforms you would have that on more platforms uh and, and in social life as well so like you don't have anything now in a lot of countries to combat that you just have to like fight them in the marketplace of ideas but like yeah, sure. Uh, that marketplace of ideas produced President Trump. It, it's it's just really difficult, and I think that we should like uh, approach this rationally and just look at the tools. Yeah, exactly. And and look at all of them, including you know the free marketplace of ideas as a tool. But a lot of the times, it's yeah. not enough. You know, so yeah, um, you can do paternalism uh, or contractionalism and also have notches exactly. like education. That's all possible. Yeah, perfectly. All right. Uh, well, I thank you very much for this. this. was very, very educational. I got my notes taken, so I'll uh, I'll remember this for the future. And yeah, if you have anything you want to uh, to mention or shout or anything, feel free to do so. And yeah. Yeah, you, uh, you can follow me on Inspector on Twitter. Um, I also have a website, inspectoreu.com. I'm working on it, um, having a lot of research. Uh, I'm making an encyclopedia. I'm going to track elections on there. Um, to make like a bigger platform uh, for people to have like a hub of, uh, of knowledge. Uh, I really like that, especially with uh, me being a teacher. Um, so you can check that out. Um, I really liked uh, talking to you, Rose, a big fan of your channel. And I really hope that maybe in the future I can uh, be on stream a bit more for certain topics. And I, I have to end with a typical message on the left, which is trans rights. Yeah, exactly. All right. Trans rights. Perfect. <laughs> All right, well, I'll, I'll probably see you uh, in chat in just a few minutes. But yeah, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Rose. All right. Very cool conversation. Very educational. I love it. Now it's gamer time, though.